I'm going to present just like a collection of works that we've been working on uh, about uh, organized crime in Medellin, uh, co-authored with Chris Bladman, Gustavo Duncan, and also Ben Lessing, who, who some of you might know already. Um, so this is not a paper, this is just a collection of findings, uh, findings around different topics on criminal organizations in Medellin. Uh, and I'm going to focus on, for instance, business lines and internal organization of these groups, market structure of these groups, different forms of criminal collusion, uh, and as well as gang governance. And this builds on a broad literature on many of these topics that I'm not going to go into the details now, but uh, are key references for our work. Um, where does this come from? Uh, roughly six and or more years uh, of interviews. Uh, we've been interviewing more than 100 gang members in Medellin repeatedly over uh, 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 the last uh, four or five years. Uh, and we have also been working on collecting a lot of administrative data plus survey data to try to understand all these phenomena. So it's mostly, this started as a project without any uh, hypothesis, but just a, like a collection of information so that we could figure out the right hypothesis and try to describe this phenomenon better. Uh, so the first uh, topic is the context. So Medellin is a relatively large city, roughly 4 million people. Uh, this is it's the second largest city in the country, uh, one of the nation's industrial and commercial centers. Uh, annual income is roughly uh, uh, 11,000 uh, per capita uh, uh, dollars. Uh, and it has like a relatively well-organized bureaucracy with high uh, uh, tax revenues, uh, relatively well-developed public service. Some of you might have been around. It's not like a poor city, it's a relatively like middle-income city and uh, in terms of, uh, uh, compared to other cities in Colombia and Latin America, like a relatively like a, a important kind of developed city. Um, on top of that, it has uh, roughly 400 small street gangs called Combos. We've been doing a census of these street gangs. Uh, they cover most or all of low and middle income uh, neighborhoods in the city. And virtually like every inch of these neighborhoods is covered by or governed or, 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 or has territorial control by some uh, organized uh, uh, criminal organization, uh, which as I mentioned are called combos. So these are small street gangs with, have a, that have existed for decades and, and have like well-defined def well borders and territories. Um, and these gangs are part of a broader like uh, uh, hierarchy of crime. So there are 400 combos on the, at the bottom of this pyramid that are controlled by 17 uh, like mafia-like organizations called razones. And these 17 razones coordinate like in collective bodies. So there's no monopoly over the razones. It's sort of an oligopoly over the city by these 17 razones. And each of these razones controls 20, 25 combos below. So what do these groups do? Uh, the combos and the razones participate like in different positions in value chains of different like illegal and legal markets. So for instance, on the drug retailing, uh, the combo is, is the one who controls the local monopoly and exploits the retail of drugs. And the razón is going to be the whole, the, the whole uh, uh, selling, the, the supplier of the wholesale drugs to the street gangs that control the retail market. Uh, if you think about, for instance, uh, other kind of businesses, money laundering, that's going to be in the part of the razón, uh, theft, robbery, and other like, like kind of smaller petty crimes are going to be controlled by the combos. Uh, and also importantly, some of these businesses are like run by the combo or the razón as a firm, while other businesses are run by independent like entrepreneurs who are members of the gangs uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a sort of like entrepreneurial activity that's uh, sponsored by the gang, but to, uh, for which the person that conducts the business has to pay a tax to the gang. So for instance, contract killings uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the case of the combo, one person from the combo might be hired to do a contract killing, that person might conduct that contract killing and has to pay a tax to the combo to which they belong. Uh, in terms of like organization, this is just the, the, like the organizational structure of one of the combos that we've been studying. Typically they have like well-established positions. Typically every combo would have one person in charge of extortion and like collecting money, another person in charge of drugs. Uh, and in the case of this combo in particular, that person would control someone who sells marijuana, someone who sells cocaine, and someone who sells 2CB, which is a different kind of drug that is also like widespread and sold in Medellin. And in the case of this combo, they also have the business of like loan sharking. So there's going to be one person in charge of, of like uh, lending the money. Uh, and in terms of income, what we've seen is that the foot soldiers 
uh, are roughly at the ninth decile in the income like, uh, of each city earners, while the coordinators or the people higher up are in the first decile of city earners. So this is a lot of money, especially in the case of the foot soldiers, and it's a strike contrast, uh, for instance, compared to what uh, Stephen Levitt and Benkatesh found in the US in the Chicago gang, where they thought that people was actually learning well below minimum wage. So in this case, that's really not true. Uh, thinking about the market structure of these, uh, of these groups or kind of a theory of the criminal firm that we've been working on. Uh, so we have the, the razones and the combos, and typically there are like three different ways of like combo razón relationships. The first one is a sort of relational contract between the combo and the razón, uh, where the, there's like, these are like kind of independent firms. Uh, the combo coordinator or the combo leader will, will be kind of the residual claimant of, on profits of the combo. Uh, the, coordinator, the coordinator or the leader of the combo is going to be from the local neighborhood, chosen by the combo itself, and they have a relationship like a sort of this relation, uh, 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 relational contract kind of relationship with the, with, the, with the razón. There's another type, which is kind of a vertically integrated firm, where all the combos below belong to the same razón, as the same, like, just the same structure. There are only two main instances that we have observed that kind of situation, and one like very outstanding razón that's known as Los Triana is a good example, where, for instance, the coordinators of the combos are rotated uh, by the razón. Uh, they don't, don't like, come from the same neighborhood. It's a kind of different, more sophisticated firm that actually was able to integrate all these, all these groups. And there are just a few handful of like, independent combos, but uh, they tend to be just conquered and controlled by some razón. So what drives these, these, these different uh, forms of organization? Uh, we believe that there are like, several forces pushing towards like vertic vertical and horizontal integration. One of those is to reduce competition. So they, it's, it's better not to have competition in order to, like, for instance, extract, extract higher uh, uh, monopolistic rents. Another thing is that integration can facilitate collusion and like, reduce like, inefficient conflict and coordinate between uh, uh, like, different branches of the same organization. Uh, and also, uh, there's this idiosyncratic factor of people wanting to be like, the leader and the controller of, of this sort of organization. So, so these, are, these are forces pushing towards like, vertical and horizontal integration. But on the other hand, there are also different forces that push against this form of organization. This is why we believe we find like, all these very like, small firms just coordinating between them, but not having high levels of vertical or horizontal integration. The first one is that integration makes these organizations like, more legible to the state, so the risk of expropriation is there. The second one is that there are sort of information and agency problems. You can think of, for instance, developing a retail drug market in a small neighborhood. You require like, trust, confidence, so typically you want people from the same neighborhood doing that. And the third one is that in order to have like, these sort of very sophisticated firms, you need like, human and managerial capital, which might not always be available there. So these are kind of the forces that we believe are, are kind of giving shape to the nature of the market structure of these gangs in Medellin. Uh, in terms of collusion, so they collude uh, in several dimensions. I'm just going to mention a couple. One is drug prices. Um, so the razones manage what we believe is kind of a sort of citywide cartel, right? Uh, because for most of the retail markets, you need to develop trust, right? So the, the street gang who controls the, the, the retail market uh, develops this relationship with consumers and dealers. Uh, so there's a risk of competition, right? There's a risk of competition between all these 400 combos within the city. But this competition would drive down prices and would, would drive down like the monopolistic rents that would be available otherwise for razones and for combos as well. Uh, so what we believe is that, or what we observe is that these razones use kind of their coercive and co coordinated capacity to actually set prices and quality and regulate the market in a way that they can extract monopolistic rents. And this is just one example of that. This, this is uh, Barra Antioquia, it's the largest uh, uh, drug market, uh, drug retail market in the city. It, pretty much in every corner, there's one different Plaza de Vicio that it's just a drug selling uh, a spot. And we found this instance through like qualitative work where Typically, like marijuana was sold by us $1 a packet, then there was like a supply, positive supply shock uh, where like a lot of drugs arrived to the city. Uh, one of the plazas de vicio decreases decreased the, the price uh, by a third. Then the other uh, combos complained to the razón and said, okay, why are these guys competing with me? The razón organized a meeting. Uh, they all agreed that this positive supply shock should actually drive prices down for everyone. So they actually settled on that everyone would set the price at like two-thirds of a dollar, 
right? So the razones play this role of coordinating prices in, a, in an efficient way so that everyone can extract uh, uh, as much rent they ca as they can. Another form of collusion in terms of, co of conflict. So with 400 combos and 17 razones on top, there are like all the ingredients for violence, right? There might be like agency problems. I don't know if you have read Chris Bladman's book, but co this comes from that. Agency problems, uh, like violent uh, preferences, uh, irrational behavior, like many reasons why one gang, one gang would fight like uh, 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 with one another, committing problems and so on. And what we see is that these razones actually appear to be solving these bargaining problems, right? So they provide a bargaining forum. Uh, they resolve community problems by, for instance, uh, enforcing borders, enforcing contracts, and so on. And they compel leaders and discipline their own members to actually drive uh, violence down. So they play kind of a UN peacekeeper kind of role to control these this, 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 this 400 street gangs uh, and avoid coastal conflict. Uh, and we've seen this through time, right? So Medellin had this uh, crazy uh, level of, of violence in the 90s, uh, homicide rate of almost 400 per 100,000 residents. Now it's roughly 16, also below Chicago, and almost as close as Sao Paulo, uh, as, as Ben was presenting before. Um, and what we believe is that these groups have played an important role in doing this. And we have instances, for instance, uh, in, in 2019, violence was spiking in the city, and the state actually leveraged on the capacity of the razones to coordinate to drive down violence again. So in, in, if you see the graph, uh, month four, April, violence was spiking in Medellin, and then most of the leaders of the Razones who were imprisoned were transferred, all like from one prison to another one. They all co coincidentally spent one week in the same prison, and then everyone sent a WhatsApp message to the city and violence went down. Okay, so this is the Razones playing this role as, as peacekeepers and the state leveraging on that to lower their violence. Uh, I'm just going to, yeah, I'm going to just, a couple of more uh, things to share and I'll finish. Governing civilians. So we also observe, this comes from a, a survey that we ran in 2019, asking people, okay, who, like, who do you go to if someone is making noise, if you see, observe a theft and so on and so forth. And we asked people, like, who would they go to? Some of them would say, I go to the state. Some of them would say, I go to the combo or the gang. Uh, and this is just combos and the state playing a role of like providing governance services in every neighborhood in the city, right? Uh, so in, to some degree, like most neighborhoods have actually like what we think is a sort of duopoly of these protection services, right? So in one neighborhood, you have a local combo who provides governance services and you have the state providing also these governance services. And we see a lot of variation across the city. So in this, in, this, in this map, all these neighborhoods who are, that are red or reddish are like mostly controlled by the combo, and those that are blue are mostly control, controlled by the state. Uh, so this is kind of a, like a, a, an election made by the combo. We try to look at what can drive that. Uh, so we actually, one of, in, in one of our papers, we, we try to examine which are the effects of like long run proximity of security and dispute resolution services on gang governance. And what we see is that as the state gets closer to the, to the, to, to the, to the to people, then unsurprisingly, like people report that they reach out to the state more. But more puzzling, we also see that people report that they go to the gang more as well. So this is kind of, this ties with, with Ben's argument on that a strong state might actually induce more gang governance. And why is that? We try to examine this like a, a, a bit further and we find that this sort of strategic response by gangs comes mainly in places where there's like a drug market to protect. So they, they, they govern more places to avoid the presence of the state so that they can enjoy more rents from the drug trade, the local drug trade uh, uh, in the retail market. And just to finish, implications for policy. So you can think of like a continuum of policy alternatives for a policymaker, right? Uh, from complete crackdown on criminal groups, which might like increase violence in the short term, but like improve long-term state legitimacy, to a sort of quid pro quo negotiation with gangs so that we, you decrease violence in the short term, but then you damage long-term state legitimacy. And the problem is that it's unclear which of these two extremes leads to higher long-term welfare, right? Uh, so the, probably the solution is somewhere in the middle, but the problem is, is where, right? And this is probably like very context specific. And it's most likely not enough, not enough information to actually made a, make a point out of this. And a final point, implications for research on organized crime. What we believe is that like, we need more research in, of, the, of, of this kind, in, not only in Medellin, but also in Italy, in Brazil, and many other places, El Salvador and others. Uh, we need to understand this system before designing and like, 
uh, uh, implementing interventions, we need to collect a lot of qualitative and quantitative data to understand this better, because mo in most of the cases, we only observe homicides and this sort of like other data that that's like hard data that's better measured. But homicides, for instance, tell just part of the story. We don't know whether gangs are growing stronger or not if we look at homicides only. Um, so, and, 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 and for this sort of effort, what we believe is that we need to set up some sort of system where groups of researchers focus on one context, uh, go to as, as much depth as possible to figure out like solutions and context in a, in a better way. Uh, so thank you very much. This will continue at some point.